guys. Um, uh, I'm Carolyn, and I uh, want to welcome you all to our September. I mean, can you believe how fast the year is flying by? Um, so our September book club, and tonight's book is called The Seamstress. And this is a book I actually read last year when I was living in Malaga in Spain. And I just thought it would be a wonderful book for us to read because it gives you so much context on the history of Spain. And I just found it helpful being there and being able to visualize what, you know, I could kind of look across the, the water, if you will, to, uh, to Morocco and, and, you know, understand what that, uh, that time must have been like during the Spanish Civil War. And then also uh franco after that and or not after that but all the things that happened uh in the 60s 70s 80s and the fact that spain is such a new country really a new democracy when we think about it so um so i thought this book would be great to read and also uh it is available on i think it's pbs as a series and some yes. of you might have had a chance to watch that and i know wendy's going to talk about all of that so that's the book we're talking about tonight. So Spain and Morocco, which also feels very timely, uh, given what's going on in Morocco recently. Um, we also have been busy picking the next six books uh, for the book club. And so we did a poll. We had several hundred women uh, participate in that poll. And we just released the results on the weekend in our Sunday book club newsletter. Hopefully you all got that. And our book for October is The Dictionary of Lost Words, which takes place in Oxford, uh, UK. And it's about the creation of the Oxford English Dictionary. So um, so kind of an interesting read. You'll, if you watch the video, we talked about each of these books. And then I think the next one we're doing is Lisa C's book, uh, Lady Tan's Circle of Women, which is, I think I found this on Reese's book club or, or one of the other book clubs, and I read it as well and thought it was a beautiful book um learned so much so those are the first two that we're doing for the for uh october and november and then we're taking a little break in december because in december we usually have a, a holiday social um which we'll be announcing shortly and then we're going to start up again in january but we wanted to give you the full uh the full six months so um, one last thing before we get started tonight i just want to mention we have another kind of book club session next thursday night and we're featuring uh, three women in their 80s and one in their 90s who has who have written memoirs. And, you know, I feel it's very important for us to um, celebrate the wisdom of, of older women. I include myself in that <laughs> description, by the way. And um, and so I'm going to be on a plane, but I've asked Diana Eaton, who's our women over 80 writer, to host this. So. Um, so this is going to be four women, 80, 83, 85, 86, and 91 on this call. Wow. I hope you all all come and support them and hear their stories and listen to their wisdom. I'll put the link in the chat in a minute uh, if you'd like to sign up. And um, and they're just amazing. I've met um, I've met two of, well, I've met three of them in person, actually, and uh, wrote some articles about their books and and I hope you can make it next Thursday night um, to hear their story. So this is the second one of these that we've done. We did a we did one. I think Sally, you were on our first one that we did mm -hmm. um, with your book. And so we're trying to profile not only you know well known writers like these writers, but also there are so many women in the Journey Woman community that have written amazing books. So I'm always looking to um, to share those as much as I can. So. Anyways, with that, I will turn it over to uh, Wendy and Sally to uh, start off our book club discussion tonight. And again, thank you all for coming and uh, please invite your friends and and um, and let them know about this so they can come join these discussions in, in the future. Thank you. And for those of you that are new tonight, uh, basically, we'll start, I'll start with talking a little bit about the author, a little bit about sort of the, the book itself. Then we'll go into a series of questions where you know, ask a question that everybody can share or not, you don't have to share, uh, but if you have something to say, just either raise your hand um, and you can share at, for the question. Um, this book I found very interesting. It, it was right up my alley because I love a spy movie, or a spy story, and I love historical fiction, uh, historical fiction, but I also like historical nonfiction. And this was a melding of true history with uh, historical fiction. And in fact, our author said that she didn't want to fictionalize real people, 
but she wanted to use her own imagination to build her own characters. So she has taken real people from the past um, and, and they, you know, so for example, Samantha Fox, a real person, uh, she actually, um, Samantha Fox, she's credited with persuading uh, Bear Bender to support Britain and not Germany when he served in Franco's cabinet. And now, although later he was discredited, as we see in the book, uh, because of his British sympathies, um, his reluctance to embrace the values of the Nazis may have well kept Spain from entering the Second World War as an active participant. Um, so, you know, there are, Samantha, that relationship did have a profound impact on history. Um, a, a few of the other characters are in the book are real as well. Now, the book itself, in, it was written in Spanish, and the title of the book in Spanish is The Time Between Seams. So it's a little bit Lovely. different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it has been written in 20, it's been translated into 25 languages. It's been sold in 75 different countries. And I think about, we call it the time in between. And I think about what, what does that in between mean? Is it between youth and adulthood? Is it between war and peace? Is it between love and duty? I mean, there's a lot of things we can talk about. What it, all of that does fit in between. Now, our author is a is a academic. She's a professor of of uh, English uh, in Spain. This was her debut novel. This was her first fictional novel. She'd only ever written academic work before, and I think for it being in her first novel, you know, we really see a lot of good prose coming out. Um, in the novel itself. She since then has written two other books. Um, one is set in the US in the 60s, 50s and 60s. Uh, and one is set, uh, I don't remember what country, I think Spain in the 1860s, or Spain, Havana and Mexico in the 1860s. And her new book, which will be released in October, October is called Sira, which is a continuation of this book. Oh, yeah. This is what happens to Sarah and Marcus after World War II is over and when they go to Israel. So uh, that's going to be released in October of this year. So looking forward to you seeing that. So with that, a little bit about the book. Well, we usually start with some favorite passages. Um, and so I'm going to, I did actually look mine up, but while I'm getting mine out on my Kindle, does anybody have any favorite sections of the book they want to share? Pam, did you? You know what, I've only gotten a little more than halfway through because yes. I wow. just found out about it a week, like a week or so ago. So, you know, going forward, I'll yeah. be more prepared, okay. but I'm enjoying it. So I definitely okay. will finish it, so. But hopefully we won't spoil too much for you. <laughs> no, <laughs> and that's okay. Believe it or not, I'm in, five book clubs if okay. I count this. I'm an avid reader, so um, that's fine. <laughs> so one of the parts I liked is when she has just uh, opened up, she's about, she's now in Morocco, she's gone through her transition, she is starting her new adventure, and she says she knows that she needs to change. She's, uh, she doesn't want, uh, she says, I, I decided to confront the future from behind a mask of security, preventing people from seeing my fear, my miseries, and the dagger that was still pursing my soul. I decided to begin with the outside, to give myself the facade of a woman who is worldly and independent, to keep people from seeing my reality as the victim of a bastard and the dark origins of my establishment I was about to open. To do that, I'd have to put on a layer of makeup over the past, invent a present in great haste, and plan out a future as false as it was magnificent. And I'd have to act quickly. I had to begin right away. Not one more tear shed, not another lament, not a single submissive look back. Everything would be present. Everything should be today. So I choose a new personality that I drew out of my sleeve like a magician might whip out a string of handkerchiefs. I decided to transform myself and my choice was to adopt the appearance of a woman who was solid, solvent and experienced. And I like and that she because she portrayed herself like the woman that her mother worked for. Right. Exactly. To kind of, you know, 
Mm-hmm. And I like that because it's really, you know, this is a, 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 a as part, it's, it's a book of reinvention, right? Mm-hmm. She had to reinvent herself several times, both um, to her general public, as well as later when she was deceiving people. But I like the fact that, you know, again, it's the whole fake it till I make it. I'm going to put, I'm going to put on the makeup, I'm going to put on the, the heels and the dress, and I'm going to act the part and no one will know. And I mm-hmm. think um, sometimes when we are afraid or hesitant, if we, if we just act the part, we can get through it. Because it's not how we feel that others see us. It's how we act that others see us. And I think that's what she was trying to portray. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I had a, a favorite passage. I won't read out the passage because it's actually just too long, I think. But just to describe it, it's the passage when she is trying to make her way through the souk. Um, and it's late, it's dark, the souk is closed, she's got all those guns scrapped, strapped to her body, and she's trying to make it to, to the railway station. And she describes how she was just completely lost in the souk because it was before dawn, and she was unable to tell what the shops were, because the shops were all shuttered. And that reminded me so much, I mean, I've, I've been in lots of, of, of historical souks in my travels and, you know, you can almost navigate by the, the, the type of trade that's being represented. So you move from the area where all the coppersmiths are and then you go to the area which is the spice area and you go to the area which is where the butchers are. And even amongst the metalwork, you know, you move from where the coppersmiths are to the goldsmiths to the tinsmiths. And it was such a beautiful passage because it, contrasted that rich sensory experience in the daylight hours with the gorgeous colors and smells and the the raucous sounds that just characterize the souk and then compares it to where she was going before dawn where everything was shuttered up and blank and how how impossible she found it to orient herself I thought it was very beautifully written well that's like today when we're out driving somewhere we're looking for places that we recognize you know to find our way and she had nothing to go by mm. i mean everything was closed up and and i it's been a while since i've been in europe but i remember those small villages they close up and then all of a sudden they open up in the morning and it's a whole different street you know mm. when they're when they're open so yeah So I just, I'm not quite finished it yet. I thought I would get it done, but I didn't. Um, It's a long one. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful book. Um, And and Carolyn, when you said about um, what's going on in Morocco now, it's like when I was in the middle of this and then, you know, all hell broke loose and burned. But I, for me, it was this, the scene where she meets her father again but when she actually is with her father and as much as she puts up this facade of you know like you were saying you know I put up this facade so nobody really knows how scared or whatever I am and she just breaks down and and it's more than a and she says something about this is only the second time my father has hugged me or something like that but I think it's more than that I think it's that whole missing of that um certainly a relationship with her father if that's what she had wanted but um a missing of that entire part of her life that she just had to give up just like that like there was no slow movement into that part of her life it was okay the new me and how she's been able to to do it. I'm actually just at the part, and I'm sorry for those who haven't finished it, but just at the part where she escapes from the hippodrome by mm-hmm. by fainting. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, so I'm really now like, okay, let's get this book finished. But I'm <laughs> so <stuff> going on. <laughs> See, and I think that was my favorite part was at the hippodrome and how she managed to get herself yeah. out of there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I thought Love that her. was, you know, I, I can't even... I, Granted, she was fictional, but I can't even imagine in my wildest dreams being clever enough to come up with that under those circumstances. Well, mm-hmm. is she fictional? Yeah, I don't. She, I, is, she, yeah, yeah, she well, is. Well, I mean, she may be based on based right, on a lot exactly. of other stories of of right. women who did this type of work, 
but she is not a specific fictional person. Right. And but she, she is not specifically trained for it either. She's just kind of quasi trained. Right. Yeah. No, and, and, a, that, and a lot of the a lot of the women and younger people during the war who did this type of work were not really trained for it. Yeah. So it comes from another place. Mm -hmm. And I I mean, I don't even pretend to know what that place is, but it comes from another place. And it's a very place of strength. Yeah. And I think I think that the hippodrome scene to me. One of the things it did is it showed that she does have that internal instinct mm -hmm. that could then be used, you know, to the, a heightened degree, which she later is, it's, it is right. used for a heightened degree. But I think that just goes to show that she has that kind of quick on her, on her feet, thinking of ways to, to get out of things and change things around, which is a, a portrayal of things to come, right? Hey. Did, <laughs> as, as it was historic, oh yeah, Mary. Oh, no, go, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, I was going to go on to another question. So go on. <laughs> oh, I just I just um, felt was I was reading it that she must know how to sew because um, because I, I love to sew. And when I was reading the part, part, the different parts throughout the book where she was describing stitching and the fabrics and it, it, it just resonated with me and, and made me miss uh, miss sewing more. So I'm going to pick up my sewing machine at some point. <laughs> But and I thought how how clever to come up with the the Morse code stitching, yeah. put that into the into the fabric and then uh, relay your messages through that. Of course, I thought I, when, when they were putting it with the stitches and the, it reminded me of the Tale of Two Cities, putting it in the knitting. Yes, you know, it's the same mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah, or the no. Underground Railroad, right? Yeah, and quilt. the quilts. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this I read a lovely article. Sorry, Wendy. I read a lovely article. It was very short. I'll find the link and pop it in the chat, which was just her talking about how she, I guess I'm fascinated with the order of how an author comes up with these ideas. And she came up first with the location because her mother was, was grew up in that part of the world in Morocco. And then she came up with the time period because she was looking at, um, the uh the the rosemary's lover i've gone blank on his name uh, um the Deirdre spanish Khan. but yes she Deirdre. she she found out about him and so that brought her the time period and then she was trying to look for a hook on the time period and she was reading up about him and then she started coming up with real life examples of of espionage of normal people being engaged in espionage and that gave her the story and then she was thinking back to her childhood where she um, she said she she spent time in the home of seamstresses. I kind of got the impression maybe going with her mum when her mum was getting dresses made and the, the the conversations between the women that used to happen there. And then that brought that whole theme out. So it, it was quite lovely, even though it was short. Um, and I wonder how much she observed Mary Burke in there when she was hanging out in in the seamstress watching the seamstresses work mm -hmm. but i think you're right i think she must have she must have inside knowledge of how to sew herself to understand that stitching you know and this is historical fiction although it is supported with historical uh, feed people um did it ch under change your understanding of spain or did it provide an, a different interpretation of of spain to you i mean i know i was not as aware of the spanish civil war um I was aware of what happened with Franco, but what happened prior to that, I was not as aware of. Um, what about some of you? Well, it seems like everything that I ever read about World War II was always, you know, French and German and, you know, the Lilac Girls and all the different yeah. things like that. It was nice to hear um, a different area, yeah. you know, a different part of it, different fragment of it. Well, and I was fascinated because I read a nonfiction history of Spain when I visited it the first time, but I was amazed at how much was going on in Morocco leading up to the Spanish Civil War. Mm. I was aware that there was that big of an influence of the Spanish down there. I knew they were there, but I didn't realize from a political standpoint it was that it was that entrenched. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Me too. I knew a little bit about the Spanish Civil War, but I knew nothing about the role in Morocco. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nothing at all. Now, the first sentence of the book, a typewriter shattered my destiny. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, the, that's an, uh, the author uses foreshadowing. 
were you immediately drawn into the story and were you interested to know how the destiny was shattered and why? Ironically, the first thing I thought of when I read that was um, the writings of Tom Hanks, because he writes a lot about typewriters. <laughs> oh, he's got a brilliant book about typewriters. And Sandy, you're the first person I've met who's read it. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. I just wow. loved he's it. really cool. And and it just, and that's what hit me was, oh, how did Tom Hanks, sort of like my brain went, well, wait a second, how did Tom Hanks get into this thing? <laughs> um, I, and, and, and I, I have, um, when we were in Venice, I think the first time, Olivetti somewhere had this display of old um, typewriters and adding machines and stuff in, in a window. And, and that's what I thought of was, you know, the old fashioned typewriter, because I had one. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and so all of that stuff and all the things that a typewriter can do for you. Um, and when you think about it, they used not a typewriter, but that sort of thing. Um, World War Two. What was Bench Benchley Park? Yeah, yeah. Where they, yeah. So coding messages. Yeah, so it it was there, but did it foreshadow it? No, I never thought about it too much, except that she fell in love with this jerk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What a jerk. <laughs> yeah, Lena, did you have something? Or well, you know, one of the things. Let's talk about the jerk for a minute, <laughs> uh, <laughs> or at least at least the the, you know, she she was seeing Ignacio. Ignacio was the hometown boy. He had a stable job. He was going to be a civil servant. He was very attentive to her. He was probably boring. Right? Mm -hmm. And then psh, in came the typewriter guy, which I always can't remember his name. Alvaro, was he? Romero. 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 Yeah. Who sparks flew. He was excitement. He was flash. And I, th you know, it reminded me some to somewhat of my past, you know, leaving the stable <laughs> one for the, for the, for the crazy one that later on is, you know, is a, is a piece of dirt, but, um, but I, you know, they think that it's, it's not unusual that people are going through that very staid process and all of a sudden they see excitement and that excitement attracts them. Now, she up and left with him like that, without really knowing him very well. And gave him all her dad's money. Yes. That and was just unbelievable. Now, that may have been because of the time, you know, the time in history that, mm -hmm. um, you know, the men were the ones that controlled the money. Um, but what were your thoughts about Ignacio versus Romero? And Ignacio coming back later. Yeah. Yeah, I thought Ignacio was a good guy. You know, when he came back later, he actually revealed a lot of depth of character, I think, in that confrontation scene with her. And that was a very powerful scene. Um, somebody earlier was mentioning, I can't remember if it was Linda or Sandy, that was talking about how how she kind of had cut off everything from her past. And, and I think being confronted with that scene with Ignacio, where he's basically saying, you know, these people are living around the corner from you. These, this is the woman who looked after you when you were a child and you, you, you've had no contact with them and they're in terrible situations. It was very powerful. And even at the beginning, I mean, I get that. I don't, I don't think Ignacio was boring as such. I mean, it's said that they went to movies and they went to parties and they went out dancing and they did all sorts of things. But yeah, she clearly, it, he might not have been boring, but the situation was boring to her because I, mean, I guess it was always predictable. Exactly. She'd been grown up that this was the man she was going to be with. Didn't you wonder if, the Ignacio we saw later had changed kind of his personality because of what she did to him. Yeah, possibly. Mm. Yeah, Probably, wonder, in fact. Because I was kind of, well, I wasn't surprised that he was fighting on the side he was fighting on, but I was surprised at how his strength in that in that regime was not something I would have expected based on the earlier one we had seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he had he had really risen up the ranks. Yeah, and was more powerful than than he had seemed when he when they were together. 
Yeah. Um, you know, Sally, you brought up the fact that, you know, when she cut everything off and later when she had, when she had to hire someone and she went back and hired mm. her Correct. previous oh. mother's boss, there's a, there's a scene, there's a, a section there that I thought was very, very poignant. She talks about when she was little, she thought that woman lived in such a wonderful, big, big house. And it was so, you know, fancy. And yet when she, now, when she went there, she realized it wasn't really, you know, it, you know, yeah. compared to the life she'd been living, um, it wasn't really, and it's that that kind of you can't really truly go home again. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, she's a she was a designer. She was born in 1911, and the story ends in the 40s. And the world of fashion changed quite a bit, um, as well as the political situation. Um, any thoughts in terms of the world of fashion? It was interesting today. I was at a at a lecture series about fashion, um, and from the eighteen hundreds to the nineteen forties. And I didn't realize that you know during this time frame was when nylon was invented, rayon was invented, a lot of these fabrics. So it really changed a lot how fashion was done um, during that period of time. Um, and when she talked about taking the crepe dress and shrinking it down and, and making it all scrunchy, uh, crepe today mm. doesn't do that, but crepe then would shrink and then you'd have to stretch it out again. So there's um, quite a bit of changes in terms of the types of fashion um, that, and she was constantly being compared to, oh, it's just like the fashion in Paris. You know, she's, because in Morocco, they couldn't get the fashion. In Spain, they couldn't get the fashion. And so that's where she filled this niche um, of the high, high styles. One of the characters I liked in terms of fashion was her downstairs neighbor. Um, Felix? He, yes, Felix. Felix. Yes. Yeah. Because Felix really knew what was happening in the fashion world, right? Yeah. And, so. Yeah. It would have been very interesting time too, because in Spain, I'm guessing, um, I don't know very much about fashion, but I'm guessing that, you know, there was that whole overturning of the society of the past, and that would have made space for new designers mm -hmm. uh, and new thoughts and new trends mm -hmm. to come out in all aspects of society. Um, so, so I'd imagine that a lot of the kind of established elite tailors and seamstresses fell out of fell out of favor because they would have served the the old powers mm -hmm. and then new people stepped into their shoes and 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 completely overturned things and it was also interesting that um the shortage of materials gave her an in she might never have been able to to make a success of of a seamstress's life in madrid if she wasn't bringing all these materials from Morocco that were just no longer available because they were being used for uniforms and bandages and parachutes. Mm -hmm. And I think also, even when she was in Morocco, the fact that she had Candelaria. I love Candelaria. <laughs> who, who was able to sort of get all this black market stuff for her, again, you know, was, uh, it was an advantage she had over others as well. So, yeah. I I think my favorite characters in the book were the borders at Candelaria. The, the, <laughs> the, the scenes of the dinner time arguments with the borders. Those were my favorites. <laughs> Sorry, Mary Burke, you had your hand up. Uh, did anybody, I, I was waiting to find out that Candelaria was ripping her off or wasn't going to give her her full half because they were splitting, splitting it. Did anybody mm -hmm. else? Or was anybody else anxious about that, thinking this isn't going to work out half and half? I, for some reason, I don't know why I thought that, but well, because she was technically a con artist too, right? You know, yeah. Well, Candelaria definitely was a con artist. Mm -hmm. But but you know, when she, did you think she might not end up giving her the full amount that she was due? Yeah. yeah in fact, I was surprised that, um, and I don't know whether it's in the book or in the miniseries that you know the money came all in to Sarah. And Sarah yeah. would then count out half and give it to Candelaria, right. which I was surprised that, yeah, they actually did do the half and half. But when she first proposed it, I thought it wasn't going to, it wasn't going to come down. Yes. When, when something switched for me in my thoughts on Candelaria, there was a moment, and I think it was quite late in the book, 
um, when the question came up of why Candelera didn't have any money because Sira had been giving all this money to her all the time. And then it transpired that Candelaria had been supporting her border, the border that died. And, and paid for his funeral and everything. And paid for his funeral and his medical expenses and everything. And that kind of had a little switch in my head for Candelaria where I realized actually she was a, mm -hmm. you know, a good person underneath the con artist uh, who was trying to make her way in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She yeah. also had a thing going with the with the cop too, yeah. Uh, who told um, um, Sarah that she had to pay back. Um, mm -hmm. I can't remember who it was, but yeah. um, and and that's who hooked her up with Candelera. Yeah, and mm. I thought Candelera was really a soft spot. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she played harsh, but she was also the one who could get the stuff um, because she was sneaky. Um, but you're right. She she wound up paying for the funeral and mm. you know and housing literally housing these people who maybe wouldn't have been able to find a place to live if it wasn't for her. I felt like Candelaria, and I can't remember what I based this on. I felt like she had, you know, she had that real kind of criminal element to her. Um, but I felt like that life had forced her into a position where she possibly, as a woman at that time had had to take that path because, um, you know, her first steps along that criminal path, I, I got the feeling that she may have been forced into that by circumstances. And then once she was in it, she found she had a real talent for it and took to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and yet I think once she set Sierra up in business, that was her way out of the criminal past. Mm -hmm. The police officer was also an interesting character because he yeah. had this quite, quite a tough, hard exterior but if it hadn't been for him and 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 introducing Sira to Candelaria and and kind of imposing those conditions on Sira I mean who know what knows what would have happened to her it was and really she like stood up to him when she said now I have a legitimate business you know and I'm I'm saving to pay my debt but she told him I want to get my mother out mm. and he still allowed her to go make arrangements, you know, that unfortunately mm. that's bad in the book. So I, I don't know what happened, but he was accommodating to her. He got her the yeah. pass that she needed and he ha gave her her passport and stuff. So, I mean, but she was able to r ride with Rosalind or whatever her name was, but um, he showed his soft side there too. So. A bit of tough love, I think. I thought it was yes. a very parental figure. You know, he, yes. was, he was really playing that figure to her. Or big brother or yeah, whatever. Right. But ladies, I'm so sorry. I have to leave. I have another appointment tonight, but it was great meeting everybody. And I will be back next month and I will Good. have the book read. Yeah. <laughs> we'll look nice forward to meeting you. you next month, Pam. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You know, with the, with the whole reinvention, now, how did Sarah, how was Sarah different than Arish? You know, when she went back, when she went to Portugal or when she went to Spain and became a rich, um, how did she reinvent herself then? Was she different or was this just a different side of her? Because essentially she was doing the same thing. Yep. She was mm -hmm. designing dresses for very fashionable women who were high up, you know, and had husbands or lovers or whatever who were high up. So I think it was more about accommodating um, so that she could do the um, espionage that they wanted her to do more mm -hmm. than anything else. I think it's just a different side of her. Same person, different side. I'm, I'm, I think when she worked with her mom, she was um, in a very bad situation. Um, and then sadly, she, you know, got with this, this, jerk R romeo or whatever well that's probably a good name for him um <laughs> probably <laughs> um but i think she moved herself from that she said i'm not letting this happen to me ever again and i'm going to have enough money to keep myself the way i want to be kept and i don't mean that in a negative way at all and so i don't i think her name changed 
Um, she had she to be had to be what she was doing. But I think it's it's just a different part of her personally. Mm. I think that she does undergo major transformations through the story, but those transformations are earlier on. Mm. Like her transformation from her stayed early life to her passionate whirlwind, disastrous romance to her devastation and then to her when she sets herself up as a seamstress in Morocco. Those are where all those transformation happens. I agree, Sandy. And then it was when uh, that that final step, I mean, yes, there was a reinvention of herself in a conscious way because she was undercover um, in, involved in espionage, but she'd already found her agency and her strength of character before that happened, I think. Yeah, I think I think that her transformation into a, a, a Rish was not so much a personal transformation as it was she was cognizant of, I think she upped her game in terms of how she mm -hmm. presented herself as slightly even more sophisticated, a little more haughty, a little more, you know, va va voom. But but I think it did not transform her character. It's just the way she presented herself. I, Mm -hmm. Whereas the earlier, the earlier transformation is when she presented, when she was going through the initial stages um, in Morocco, where she had to put on this, this face, she grew into it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and became that person. Whereas in, in, in Spain, she was putting on a face that she knew that was a face and, but it wasn't changing her personality. Mm -hmm. And yet, when she was back in Madrid, you know, when Ignacio chewed her out, a, she had left a huge part of herself somewhere. Yeah. And I, you know, she was she was under orders not to go back and see her neighbors. And, and I understand why she didn't. But I think he was right. I think she forgot who they were and where she came from and what living hell they were going through at the time. Mm -hmm. So I think a part of her died that maybe came back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't particularly warm to her as a person. Mm -hmm. True. I mean, I found the book interesting. I found the story good. I found the writing good. Um, the plot was excellent. But yeah, I didn't actually warm to her as an individual, as a character. Um, mm. Because I think exactly that. And, you know, there probably were reasons for that. She had built the shell around herself after these horrible things that happened to mm. her when she was younger. And that's probably the reasons. But I don't I don't know that if I met her, I would want her to be my best friend mm. um, for those reasons. She wasn't very empathetic in, in, in many instances. I think she had to build that shell. Mm. She, you know, and, and I agree with you. She wasn't. She forgot where she came from um and and that happens a lot you know mm -hmm. you I mean even in today's world when you when you come if you come into money or whatever or fame you sometimes really forget where you came from did you come from poverty did you come from pain because many people come from that and forget where they came from so they're not they won't go home again. And, and Wendy, you said it, you can't go home again. Sometimes those people have to go home again mm -hmm. to remember, to remember humility, I think. You know, Sarah does some extraordinary things in her lifetime. Does that make her a heroine? Or is she simply acting based on circumstances? Hmm. I think both. I think so. You too. know, I, th I think I think that's true of heroes, of people we think even the most inspirational, bravest people in the world are really, you know, we all get up every day and we just do the best we can out of each day. And some people are stronger and braver than others of us, maybe. But I think we're all reacting to our circumstances and it's all, it's all incremental. You know, you look from the outside at someone's life and you think, oh, this is incredible. And they did these amazing things. But really, they were getting up in the morning and doing the best they could. Um, and I think that's the case with her. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if said... she would have done these things if she hadn't been kind of thrust into those circumstances. Yes, because I don't think she would have planned to do those things. Mm. They, they just kind of happened and they presented themselves and 
that was her way out each time. Now, did anybody watch the movie version other than myself? Or the, the... I did. Yeah. What did you think, Elena? I thought it was great. And um, forgive me for not entering the discussion, but I read the book several years ago. So I forgot a lot of the details, but I really loved it. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually watched it in um, in Mexico, so I watched it in Spanish to yeah, improve yeah. my Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, but fortunately, because I knew the plot, I could understand most of it. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I, thought, mm -hmm. I thought the movie version was really excellent. Yeah, it was. I I really enjoyed it. Anybody, please, if you have a chance, it's on it's on PBS. Um, it at least in the U.S. it's in PBS. It was a mini series in Spain. Um, in in the, the PBS version, it is in Spanish, but there are subtitles and you get very used to it. Um, it won almost every major award there was in Spain. Mm. Best actress, best director, best screenplay, um, best mini series. It's just, mm. it's, it was very well done. Um, and the it does, ha keeps very, very close to the book. Two little places where it's off a bit. Um, one is the guns that get strapped to her. Well, mm -hmm. in the movie, we find out where the guns came from. Whereas in the book, she just happens to have them, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think, so that's one place that was different. And um, there was one, oh, and then there's a, a place in the movie um, where she gets to, where she was the uh, hippodrome scene uh, in the movie, um, that does trigger someone to 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 say, "Hey, I know who you are. I saw you that night, and I recognize you." And and so um, that is again. But those are the only two places that the movie veered at all from the book. Other than that, it was just step by step the book, and and it was fascinating. The scenes in Morocco were just mm. vivid. Um, mm. The clothing was spectacular. Uh, and the acting was very, very good. So, what's it I, called? I, it's called the time in between. Oh, yeah. the okay. The movie is the same. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't see the TV series, but I did read and just in a blog when I was researching this, I read someone saying that that uh, when the TV show was released in Spain, that online sales of sewing machines in Spain increased by one hundred and seventy six percent. Great. I don't know if that's a true stat or over what period of time, but it did give me a laugh. Yeah, yeah. Did the book make any of you want to travel to Spain or Morocco? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Morocco. Mm. Yeah. I, yeah, I've been to Spain. I've never been to Morocco. And it's, um, it's yeah, it's a possibility. Not right now. <laughs> Not right now. Um, that's the last thing in the world they need are tourists right now. But um, yeah, I and I quite like the parts of Spain I was in and I saw a lot of the Moorish details and all that stuff mm. so I think I would just see more in Morocco right makes sense makes sense yeah I mean I haven't I seen, love Spain I haven't but I really book. sorry go on. go on Sandra I haven't read the book but I wanted to come and listen to you talking about it and just listening to you talking makes me want to go back I've been to Spain many many times I walked the Camino Carlin along the top uh, uh -huh, I, lived in, I lived in Mallorca for one winter and I taught Wow. English and other places and I'm just dying to jump on a plane and go back now. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that I think going to Morocco is essential to understanding Spain and mm -hmm. and when you when you've spent time in Morocco and you and then you come back to Spain and you see mm -hmm. um you know all of all of the Moorish elements that have that that are in southern Spain, I think it just deepens your understanding of of uh of what went on in the in the the I mean, you just forget that Spain is ancient, like, yeah. you know, um, in, that, in that area of Southern Spain in particular, you know, right up to Cordoba and Seville and everywhere is, um, there's just beautiful, beautiful um, things that have been preserved, thank goodness, mm -hmm. from that time. So, so I really suggested and in terms of going to Morocco, you know, obviously I don't think now is the time either, although they are kind of saying come to some places of Morocco, right. but, um, uh, but uh, I, I spent three weeks in Morocco, uh, gosh, I don't know, five, six years ago, and 
and and and I just think those two countries go kind of hand in hand. So, now we had another book that was had some more. We had Morocco in it just recently, didn't we? Yeah, we this, have we've done a few. Yeah, it's a very popular. Was, but um, the, yeah, but this one really intrigued me to want to go. I'm not sure why, but it really. Yeah, did. the one we other one we read was by Alice Morrison. Tangerines. Yeah, um, oh, yes, and Morocco to Timbuktu. Mm -hmm. And yes, Morocco to Timbuktu. And yeah. then we did one another one uh about the divers about clothes backpack, lie empty. Yes. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah. we've done several books on yeah. Morocco, but I, I think this one is a little more um, you know, obviously more realistic. Yeah. Yeah. Um but yeah, it's a very I think it's a very um sensory country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've I've yeah. been lucky enough to go for a short time and reading the book about her and somebody brought it up being lost with the guns going through the sook until you've been in one of those and and you're trying to find your way through in daylight yeah mm -hmm. it's 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 sensory overload it really yeah. really is because you just kind of wander through and of course when we were there we had the the you know usual guy from tangiers following us offering yeah. to help yeah. but mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, and sell you a rug. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies, we're we're coming to the end of our hour.